All right, so uh, our company is based in Boston, and uh, I've been working uh, in this field developing uh, DEXA technology for over 20 years now. And we've uh, made quite a bit of progress on our latest uh, applications in, in uh, body composition assessment, which we'll talk about in just a minute. I'd like to now move forward and talk a little bit. It's about a half an hour presentation, so we'll, we'll try to um, get this over with quickly so we can have a little interactive uh, discussion and so forth uh, with, with you folks as we go. So just want to explain the technical basis for this measurement. It's actually very simple. The DEXA machine takes a picture of your whole body at two different energy levels, so high energy x-ray level and a, and a low energy x-ray level. And it turns out from those two pictures, we can determine the fat mass and the lean mass in each pixel element of that scan. And if we then sum up the fat and lean mass over all the pixels in the, pixels in the scan, it actually equals the subject's weight and the amount of fat mass and amount of lean mass that's there. So it's a very accurate technology. It's a very simple technology. And it, it, it's quite reliable, in fact. So if you just remember that, you have, uh, you've measured two, uh, the absorption of the x-rays at two different energies. With that information, you can measure two materials. And the materials that we're measuring are fat mass and lean mass. So on to the obesity epidemic. Uh, more than 9 million Australians, or between 60 and 70% of the population, is either overweight or obese, uh, as evaluated by body mass index, which is the sort of clinical standard for measuring obesity. And the situation is very similar uh, in the U.S. as well. And it's estimated that it'll cause an extra 125,000 deaths over the next 20 years alone, and that, that estimate might be uh, conservative, and also an extra 700,000 heart-related uh, hospitalizations. And so it's pretty clear that obesity now is uh, Amer uh, America and Australia's number one uh, public health problem. And they're working hard uh, to fix this problem because it's a very significant threat, uh, both financially and, and in terms of the public health. Even more serious, perhaps, is that nearly 25% of Australia's children are obese or overweight. And that's a big problem because we're going to be dealing with a generation of people that have been overweight or obese their entire life. And as a result of that, uh, obesity, as you probably know, is a very big lead-in to certain types of diseases, for example, type 2 diabetes. And the latest estimates suggest that it's costing well over a billion a year, and that, that number is actually quite low probably much more than that. So what are the main uh, health-related risks of being overweight or obese? Well, the main one is really probably pretty well known to most of you, type 2 diabetes, and it results in lower insulin production, and with that, uh, also cellular insulin resistance. So you make less ins insulin that you, that you need, and your cells are resistant to that, to that insulin, and as a result, uh, you can't really control your blood sugar, so you have chronically high blood sugar, and that has a, a lot of uh, very serious effects on almost every organ and organ system in the body. In addition to that, there's uh, increases in heart disease, increases in cardiovascular disease, risk of stroke and heart attack, and also arrhythmias uh, increase quite a bit. And of course, hypertension, which is sort of a silent killer, high blood pressure, greatly raises the risk of both heart attack, uh, stroke, and kidney failure. And then there's a, a concurrence of, of diseases called metabolic syndrome. And so if you have um, obesity, and particularly abdominal obesity, and you have hypertension, abnormal lipid levels, or high levels of blood sugar, uh, you have metabolic syndrome. In fact, you only have to have three of those four things to qualify for that disease. And that disease is, is exploding in the population right now, and it's, it's a serious threat to the public health. What's the root cause of obesity? Well, clearly it's an imbalance between energy intake and energy expenditure. And the main issues around that are an increased consumption of energy-dense foods, so foods high in fat and high in sugar. In addition to that, there's decreased energy expenditure due to lifestyle uh, issues and uh, sedentary lifestyle in general. Well, I don't know what the solution to this is, but they've looked at this at a lot of different angles, and the Obesity Policy Commission here in Australia recommended urgent, urgent and comprehensive actions. 
including a range of regulatory reforms and laws, policies and projects and programs to curb uh, this epidemic. So they're treating it like a disease. And it really should be thought about like a disease because it carries with it very, very significant health risks. So here's a body mass index scale. Many of you probably use this to, to evaluate your own height and weight, but it's uh, effectively your, your weight uh, in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. And the WHO uses this to classify people into underweight, normal, and overweight uh, and obesity uh, classes. And as you get more and more obese, your uh, health-related uh, risks increase. It's also very unhealthy to be se severely underweight. Um, and so this is the, the sort of the gold clinical standard for, for evaluating obesity, but it has some limitations. So body mass index versus uh, another index which we call fat mass index, which the DEXA machine is able to measure. So currently BMI is, is, the, is the standard measure for clinical obesity, but th there are some problems with it. It's a measure of excess weight. Uh, it's not excess fat, so it's a, it's a bit of a blunt instrument, isn't it? And it's not gender specific, so the same reference values and the same classifications are used for both, both genders, but we know that women proportionately have more fat. And the advantage of this fat mass index is that it is a measure of excess fat that's not confounded or confused by uh, lean mass. So a muscular subject uh, would still come out in the same category. It wouldn't depend on how much muscle you have. It would only campaign, uh, depend upon the fat mass that you carried. And it also has gender-specific reference values in the range of 5 to 9 kilograms per meter squared for women and 3 to 6 kilograms per meter squared in men. So here's another classification scheme, just like BMI, but only with fat mass index showing the normal range for, for males and females and the various uh, excess fat and, and obese, uh, obesity classes. But this time they're uh, based on fat mass index, so just the fat measure, not, not the measure of total weight. And uh, this is uh, probably um, a better way to classify subjects. We've had several examples already this week where we've measured some lean subjects and based on BMI, they were in the overweight or well, solidly overweight category, and we measured them on the DEXA machine, and they're in the third or fourth percentile for percent fat. So they're actually extremely lean. And, and so this is a, a much better uh, classification scheme. As well as the uh, amount of fat you have, the global amount of fat, it's uh, also important to um, understand and to evaluate where that fat is distributed. And this android fat, the belly fat, is more dangerous than the gynoid fat or the fat that gets carried around the buttocks and hips. And here's a dual energy projected image showing this android region that we measured. The machine identifies this region automatically in the, in the reddish area and also the gynoid region down below. And then we calculate a ratio of the fat mass in those two areas. And uh, this android gynoid ratio may predict cardiovascular disease and other health problems. So you want to have a, a low a low android gynoid ratio, uh, re, uh, ratio. that's the, uh, the target anyway. We've also been working on measuring visceral adipose tissue, and that's the fat in and around the abdom abdominal organs, and it's been shown to be a risk factor for all-cause mortality in men. So if you have high visceral fat in your male, you're more likely to, uh, to be at, at risk for dying. And it's been also been shown in several different studies that uh, visceral adipose tissue is a unique pathogenic fat depot. So it's a disease-causing fat depot, and it's associated with metabolic risk factors like high triglycerides, high cholesterol. And so we're um, very interested in, in advancing the field in this area because this visceral adipose tissue, this pathogenic fat, is um, a, a, an area of active interest and it's not something you could you could determine by the standard measures even uh, waist circumference or, or BMI there's no way of knowing how much of this visceral visceral fat you have the subcutaneous fat is the uh, fat that's sort of under your skin and it's really mostly for energy storage but this fat in and around your abdominal organs and in the liver is metabolically very active and, and so it uh, mobilizes things like triglycerides and cholesterol releases those into your bloodstream and those build up arterial plaques and can lead to cardiovascular disease so it's a, this is an important measure that uh, DEX is quite good at. 
we have a couple of patents on this technique because it's a dual energy projection. So um, previous techniques that measured that measured visceral fat were computed tomography, which is a, obviously a three-dimensional axial uh, measurement and also MRI. But we're able to actually make this measurement now with our DEXA machine uh, by some uh, clever uh, new developments. And what we're showing here is this little stylized diagram of, of uh, a projection of your abdomen. And we're actually able to measure this uh, subcutaneous fat. This is a nearly pure region of subcutaneous fat that you find in, in everyone. And then inside of that, we have this uh, abdominal wall. And the, and the DEXA machine can actually uh, identify this abdominal wall based on the density difference between it and the subcutaneous fat. So we can measure the subcutaneous fat on both sides. And you can think of that as a ring of fat all around your body. And we also measure the, the visceral fat inside the uh, abdominal muscle. And, that, and so that's the fat you know, around your abdominal uh, organs. And then we can also make a very good measure of the total fat in this region just by just putting a region right across the whole thing. So with these three measures, we're actually able to uh, predict uh, visceral fat measured by computed tomography. But there's a tremendous advantage that DEXA has over computed tomography. And if you look at this slide here, you'll see that uh, actually on the vertical axis here is the gold standard visceral adipose tissue measurement by computed tomography. And down below is the DEXA measurement of that, of that same visceral fat. And you see a very high uh, linear relation and a fairly low uh, standard error. And so there's a very uh, strong ability for DEXA to predict this computed tomography measurement. But the advantage that uh, the DEXA has is that it's maybe 100 to 1,000 times lower in terms of radiation dose. The dose from this DEXA exam is a little bit less than a half a day's dose just from living, just from natural background sources, and even less than, say, a, a transcontinental air flight. And people think nothing of getting in a plane and flying across the country. And the dose from this machine is uh, even less than that. In addition, uh, this cost of uh, computer tomography scans costs on the order of seven or eight hundred dollars, at least in the U.S. And so the DEXA exam is much more cost-effective way and a much safer, um, much less radiation-intensive way to get the exact same information you could get from computer tomography. And that's important because it, it's a screening tool, right? You don't necessarily have a disease, but you want to know how much visceral fat do I have, how much total fat do I have. And so screening tools need to be low cost, they need to be accessible, and they need to be extremely safe because you're planning on using them in populations that you're not necessarily sure they're, they're sick. It's, a, it's a more of a screening measure. So I want to talk a little bit about the reference data that we use uh, for this device because we've got these wonderful measurements. We've got fat mass index. We'll talk about lean mass index. We'll talk about appendicular lean mass, which is your major functional muscles. We make all these measurements with the DEXA machine, but we really need a reference population to compare them to because then we can determine you know, what percentile you're in. Are you in the 40th or 50th percentile for percent fat? Are you in the 90th percentile for fat mass index? You know, are there only a handful of people that are fatter than you or leaner than you? And so the competent interpretation of these DEXA measurements uh, relies very heavily upon reference databases. And this NHANES survey is uh, a survey that was conducted in the US. It's a, a National Institute of Health survey. It stands for their National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And they took these uh, hologic DEXA machines around in these mobile installations and measured more than 23,000 subjects. It's the type of uh, study that no one else could possibly aff afford to do. And they came up with a very uh, nice database that we then uh, downloaded from the Center for Disease Control website. And we developed a bunch of different reference databases. And this is the paper that that's based on. And uh, one of the main things in the paper was something I showed you before, this fat mass index scale. So like the BMI scale, we have this FMI scale for obesity classification. So we modeled this reference data with some very sophisticated uh, modeling programs called LMS, which were used to generate the reference curves that are in the DEXA machine now. now it turns out that many biological variables like height and weight uh, body mass index and, and percent fat are heavily skewed. They're not normally distributed. And when the data are not normally distributed, the standard deviation does not apply in the usual sense. So in order to determine what percentile you're in, you need to take um, some more uh, extra precautions. And just to show you that the types of reference databases that we developed, uh, we developed in, in yellow here several uh, 
databases for, for adipose issues, we have the fat mass over height squared, your, fat, your FMI or fat mass index, also total body percent fat, so the amount of your body weight that's fat, and then two uh, fat mass ratios, a percent fat trunk divided by percent fat legs, and also trunk to limb fat mass ratio. And these two, um, these two ratios are very important in a disease called lipodystrophy, which is an abnormal uh, distribution of fat mass that occurs with certain treatments. For example, um, HIV subjects who, who get treated with antiretroviral agents, they often have a very unnatural redistribution of their body fat. And this technology is very accurate and uh, very precise at picking up these early changes. And so it's a big problem for that, for that patient population. We also have a couple lean mass indices. We have your total lean mass over your height squared. So just like the fat mass, only the lean mass component. And then your appendicular lean mass, that's the uh, major functional muscles of your arms and legs. And this is a really good measure. It's been shown to predict uh, functional disability in the elderly. In addition to that, there are a couple of uh, bone mineral density and bone mineral content reference databases for skeletal health. So I told you that the, the reference data are, are lopsided a little bit. They're skew to one side. They're not normally distributed. And I'm going to show you why that's important right now and why it's important to use the correct models. We have a, the median value here. This is percent fat. and It's actually in a pediatric population, but it also applies to adults. And you see the median value here. And then the 25th, 10th, and 2nd percentiles group rather closely below it. And then you see as you get fatter, you, um, the, 20, the 75th, 90th, and 98th are quite a bit more spread out. And so it's really not normally distributed. So if you, if you think about this, you, you can only get to a certain percent fat where you, where you don't have any fat anymore. And at that point, it's really not survivable. In fact, if you get down to about somewhere between 5 and 10 percent fat, um, you're, you're at risk of, of death, of just being dying from malnutrition, heart failure, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, people can get very, very large, right? You can just continue to eat and eat and get extremely fat. And so that's why this whole distribution is skew. And you have to account for that underlying skewness in the data if you want to get accurate diagnostic scores. So here's an example, a 12-year-old subject, he's dex of percent fat with 17%. Believe it or not, that's actually pretty lean with this technology. Um, if you use this LMS method, which accounts for the skewness, you calculate a standard deviation score of minus two. So he's about minus two standard deviations below his age-matched value. And that would put him in the third percentile, which is actually quite low, right? 97% of the population is, has more uh, higher percent fat. If you don't adjust for it, if you just take a normal standard deviation without adjusting for the fact that the data is skewed, you actually get a standard deviation score that's quite a bit different, minus 1.4 and you'd only be in the ninth percentile. So it's really important to model this data well in order to get a confident and accurate interpretation of the actual measurement that you have versus a, a population of healthy people. <coughs> so here's our clinical body composition report that the DEXA machine produces. So this is sort of the output of the device, if you will. And it has a color uh, image of the fat distributions with color image mapping, and we'll ha have a better picture of that, but you can see the almost pure subcutaneous fat in the yellow, and as you get into the redder and bluer regions, that's leaner tissue and, and bone. And there's a body composition results table. I'm sorry that you can't read that, but we have a, a better image coming up. There's a percent fat reference curve here. Here's the median value. Here's the lower end and, and the upper end. So that whole range here would be 95% confidence range. So if you're above this, you're in the 97th or 98th percentile. If you're down in here, you're in the second or third percentile. And we've actually had a couple people today uh, and one yesterday that were in the second or third percentile, extremely lean, extremely fit people. It's very unusual to see in, in clinical medicine, but this group's a little bit special. Maybe we have a volunteer today. We'll see if we can get some more unusual results. And uh, down here is the the body mass index scale. And it was interesting too, many of the subjects that had very low lean mass actually, uh, very low fat mass actually were overweight. Some of the, uh, the body builders, they were overweight by BMI. So here are some of the DEXA report elements broken down. This color image mapping can be used as a, as a counseling tool and we can map those serially over time. We have an example of that where there's a, a diet and exercise intervention and you can actually see the uh, fat sort of disappearing over time uh, due to the effectiveness of this intervention. 
And you can see the near, nearly pure subcutaneous fat that's in, in yellow. And, and these images we feel may be useful for a counseling tool or for some mo motivation and so forth. Here's a rate of change report. And again, this was a, a person who was actually training for an Ironman competition. And you can see the, some of the changes in his a serial image uh, starting out here and ending up over here about a year later. And up here we have his percent fat results. He started up in the sort of upper end of the normal range. He kind of dropped off down below the median uh, within a, a year or so. This is com a compartmental trending plot. So this is your lean mass, this blue area, and this is the fat mass. And the sum of these is your total mass. So the machine make, makes a very accurate measurement of your, of your weight within 500 grams or so. And you can see here that over time, his fat compartment is shrinking. And his lean initially goes down a little bit because you do lose some water when you first lose some weight. Uh, but then it stabilizes and actually increases a little. And he was training for this, for this Ironman competition. So that gives you an idea. And that, that's really what you're looking for, right, in terms of uh, improving somebody's fitness and, and, and reducing their level of fat is to have that fat mass uh, compartment shrinking and the lean mass stable or even improving a little bit. So as far as clinical utility, what would you use some of these measures for? So we have these adipose indices and we have some lean mass indices. And I mentioned a little bit of, about this earlier, but you have your total body percent fat, the percent of your body that's fat. This result is about 33%. And then we compare that to young normal subjects around age 25 and also to age-matched peers. And the reason that we do that is that people tend to gain uh, fat as they get older. And even though that's normal, it's not necessarily healthy, right? So if you're just comparing uh, a subject to an aging population that's also getting fat and they look like they're staying about the same relative to their peers, you might conclude, well, okay, they're, they're doing what everybody else is doing. That, that seems fine. But just because it's natural or normal to gain weight as you age doesn't mean it's healthy. And so when we compare you back to the young normal population, these are relatively fit people. So if you can maintain the 50th percentile or better in the young no against the young normal peers, you're really a lot in a lot better shape than you know, maintaining uh, 50th percentile and age matched. So we, we provide both, both comparisons. In addition to that, we have the fat mass index. It's showing somewhat similar trends, right, if against young normal, against age matched. And then uh, two fat mass ratio measures. These are both, uh, this one's actually a little bit low. These are both pretty normal, though, and, and really f I'm focusing on the young normal comparisons here because that's the one that really tells you, compared to a young normal population, how are we doing? And, and you know, don't forget, you know, young normal people age 25, cardiovascular disease almost non-existent, and, you know, most people aren't obese. They don't have uh, obesity-related issues, high triglycerides, and so forth. And then there's a couple lean mass indices, so some of the trainers might be interested in this. This subject actually, compared to young normal uh, subjects, is in the 15th percentile for lean mass and the 16th percentile for appendicular lean mass. So he's low in both those categories. So here, here you want to have a high result, right? You want to be at least at the median, maybe a little bit higher. And here you actually want to be lower. So this person could use... Uh, some sort of diet or, or physical training intervention, try to get these numbers down, to the fat numbers down to, to around the median, and maybe boost up their um, appendicular lean and lean mass uh, results to more towards the median. I want to talk about this just a little bit because it's an interesting disease, uh, lipodystrophy, which is uh, where peripheral fat is lost from the arms and legs and it gets redistributed in the upper trunk and the abdomen. So you get this movement of the fat from your peripheral body into your central body. And it's a really very unnatural uh, looking uh, disease and it's a very big concern uh, of people who treat uh, HIV subjects. And we'll just look at a paper uh, that was published by Vonnet where they looked at um, controls in HIV subjects decade by decade. So they're all decade matched and, you know, 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s. And they looked at, when they looked at the heights and weights of these, of these controls for each group, the controls in the HIV subjects, they were all pretty similar, the height and the BMI, excuse me. So if you just measured them with a, a scale or calculated their body mass index, you'd say, well, you know, these are all pretty similar. But then they took, uh, took the DEXA measurements on them and they calculated this ratio, which was just the percent fat that they had in their trunk divided by the percent fat in their legs. 
And the, you know, the theory was that if you get this re unnatural redistribution, that this ratio will be a lot higher. And sure enough, even in the, in the very young people, uh, there was a significant difference in, the, uh, in this ratio. And, and you see how the, dif the difference increases as that population ages. Well, th these people are the sicker people. They've been sick longer and they've been treated longer. So they have a, a much more serious case of lipodystrophy. And in fact, by eye, you couldn't even tell that these people were affected and maybe even these affected, but very affected by this disease. But very early on, the DEXA machine can detect a difference. And that'll lead the physician or the clinician to say, well, maybe we'll stop this intervention or reduce the dose or try a different medication because it's a, it's a really big problem uh, for, for uh, the management of, of HIV. So this, this fat mass ratio is, is diagnostic for this, this condition called lipodystrophy. You may not have heard this disease either, but it's sarcopenia. It's loss of skeletal muscle mass, and with that loss of mass, loss of strength and, and muscle quality, it's a very common uh, condition in, in elderly people, and it actually predicts uh, functional disability. So if you have a very low, ma uh, low lean mass over height or appendicular lean mass over height, then you're much more likely to have one or more functional disabilities. Uh, for example, you might not be able to get up and, from a chair, from a sitting position, or you might not be able to walk a quarter mile. And this is a study where they took um, people who had an appendicular lean mass, so that's the lean mass of your arms and legs, two standard deviations below a young normal population. So you'd be in about the third percentile for young normal subjects. So they measured these people, and if they were in the third percentile for young normal subjects, they said, well, how many functional disabilities do they have? And in fact, for men, if you were in that two standard deviations below young normal group, you had three almost four times more likely to have three or more functional disabilities. And the uh, situation was even worse for women. You had almost four times more likely to have three or more functional disabilities. And in fact, the, the 95 percent confidence interval is all the way, goes all the way up to 10. So you could have been as much as 10 times more likely to have um, major functional disabilities. So this, this measure, this uh, appendicular lean mass over height squared is, is very predictive of functional impairment, functional disability. This is a, an interesting study. I think that you'll all um, be a little surprised maybe by the results, but they took 20 young women. They also did the same exact study in men, but these are college-age women, and they randomized them into two groups, the milk group and the control group. And the control group, uh, they, they drank an isoenergetic uh, energy drink like Gatorade after their workout. So they both groups did progressive weight training five days a week for 12 weeks, and then this exercise regimen was very well controlled. So they all worked out almost exactly the same. And they kept their regular diet, but after the, right after the, immediately after the exercise, the milk group drank a half a liter of fat-free milk, and then another half an hour liter, a half, an hour, a half a liter an hour later. And the control group did the same thing, but instead of milk, they drank the energy drink. And it's a little difficult to see this here, but this is actually the change in weight or mass measured by the DEXA machine. The milk group's in black, and the control or energy drinks in white. And the milk group gained about 500 grams in, in total weight. And the control group, the, the energy drink group, gained about 750 grams. So both groups gained a little bit of weight. And they said, well, okay, they're, you know, they're working out, they're exercising, they're lifting weights, they built some lean mass up. I guess we, I guess we, can, uh, we can live with that. But they were a little bit concerned you know, about what was going on, so they looked into it a little bit further, and they found that both groups also gained strength, 40 to 100 percent more strength on the various exercises. But the milk group gained more strength than the, than the control group for the bench press and trended towards greater strength for the chest fly and the leg press. So it looked like the milk group's doing a little better at this point. And the, the milk study was encouraged by that. But when they looked into it even further, and these are the results that are really interesting, they found that the change in lean mass for the milk group was almost two kilograms. So they built up almost two kilograms of lean mass over here on the right and the control group a little over a kilogram and that, that difference was highly significant. In addition to that, the milk group lost almost a kilogram and a half of fat mass, and the con control group barely lost any. So uh, this is really uh, quite an impressive result for a 12-week study. 
a two kilogram gain in lean mass and a one and a half kilogram loss in fat mass. And uh, this, this result sort of demonstrated the, uh, the, the efficacy of this, of this DEXA measurement because without that uh, information from the DEXA machine, there'd been no way of knowing which one of these groups did better. And it's pretty clear evidence that, you know, at least for this study, uh, that the milk group actually uh, outperformed the control group in terms of, you know, building lean muscle and, and losing fat mass, and the, the weight gain was, was reasonably stable. So they were, they were encouraged by that, and we actually have a couple copies of this study if you want to have a look at it and maybe um, draw your own conclusions and so forth. <clears throat> so just in conclusion here, uh, DEX, is, DEX is an accurate and validated method for measuring total and regional fat mass and lean mass. And it may be used for the diagnosis and monitoring of diseases progression or improvements in obesity, sarcopenia, which is that muscle wasting disease, or lipodystrophy, the, uh, the abnormal uh, distribution of fat. And it's a sensitive indicator of interventions that may modify fat and lean mass. So they're, it's really a pretty good tool for assessing changes in body composition from diet, health, to exercise, and Maybe even someday we'll, we'll have a pill that we can take, you know, and that'll be all we need and we won't need to work out anymore. And I'm sure we'll be involved in some of those studies before too long. Okay, so that's all I have to say for now. And um, thank you for your attention and for your continued support of, of Hologic and, and City Clinic.